cooperation versus competition, etc. Mm -hmm. I want to. I, I would like to to know more about your overall big picture. Yeah, uh, great question to start with. Overall big picture. I mean, it's you can say the technology part is kind of misleading because we're not really after technology, but as far as evolving to freedom, like in, we're talking about the very big thing. Um, so, but at the same time, in order to have a democratic society, you need to have democratic technology. And I could get into how I arrived at that conclusion, but but right now our technology is not really serving human needs, and that's one thing we need to correct. Uh, we talk a lot about pressing world issues. What are those? Well, certainly the technological infrastructure, the technosphere in general, needs to serve people better. And for us, that's that's just minding our own business, open sourcing the blueprints for critical machines, production machines, and technology in general, by, by taking technology and saying, that, hey, this is a modular set of items. It's got a bunch of building blocks like Legos. We're going to take those, which are which of the which are about 500 elements about. We have the Global Village construction set, which is 50 different machines, but you can break them down further into more underlying uh, pattern language of about 500 items. We're saying, hey, uh, let's open source this. The distributed economy uh, is, uh, is an idea that's, that's a good idea. It's worth pursuing. We live in a centralized world and uh, we need to democratize things. We need to do a little better on some things, uh, namely correcting the last frontier of economics, which is uh, we've solved production. There's not, not a question of how abundantly we can produce and whether there's enough resources uh, because the sun gives us much more power than we need. Um, but the, the last frontier is the distribution of that wealth to all the world's people for prosperity. It's, so that's that goes back to the freedom I talked about, which is... Uh, what we're after. There's also an ecological aspect, just the fact that you're referring to an open source ecology, which I'm not yeah. sure if the ecology you're referring to is is the same ecology that I'm thinking about. But it, you have talked about ecocide and and safeguarding the environment. Yeah. So how do you see this movement yeah. being tied into those issues? Yeah, absolutely. So ecology refers to the integration of human and natural ecosystems here. So ecology is greater than the standard word ecology people use. People typically use that to refer to natural ecosystems. Here we talk about the blend of that plus the technosphere, which are all part of the greater ecology of how things work. So you have these 50 machines that make up the Global Village construction set. How did you come about this? How did you settle upon those 50 particular machines? Yeah, uh, well you can go, you can actually see, see the reference on that on the wiki, which is uh, the product selection metric. But when you think about it initially, when I thought about it initially, it's like what are some of the critical enabling technologies that make for prosperity? So came up with a few criteria, such as has to be very important, such as a billion dollar at least, as far as market. It has to be somewhat scarce in the sense that it's either expensive or hard to attain. Um, it has to be ecological and, well, basically the that, that's getting into the properties of the actual how we design things. But as a basic selection uh, metric is a highly relevant technology, I mean it's a huge market, and that would help the most people. And we looked at simply the critical infrastructure building tools, assuming that we need to survive and thrive, survive from natural resources. That's once again going back to the ecology. So what are the most critical enabling tools that take us from dirt and twigs into advanced civilization? And that's how the list was uh, come up with. You can look at the details of that on the product selection metric on the wiki. So there's a metric. Does that mean that the choice of the components of that construction set hmm. uh, can be modified, or have they evolved uh, over time since you started yeah. this project? Yeah, and actually that's that's a good question because it's not like, oh, this is absolutely it. This is the 50 things that are there, period. It's actually somewhat like a business where the first thing you learn, you, you, you modify, you know, you, you start correcting things. But no, I mean, the system has been largely the same except for some minor tweaks in it. Like, for example, we have added the house to that. 
because that is the number one cost of living. It can be considered a machine or a technology or a <laughs> whole system. It's a more product system, but we added that, for example, and took out, like initially, for example, we had the, the boundary layer turbine as, a, as an e easy way to, the, essentially, the Tesla turbine in there, but we've since replaced that. So just little tweaks, but other than that, you've got machines for making energy, for producing technologies, for doing agriculture, for construction, and producing some critical materials. Um, but it's not set in stone because the thing is, are you still there? Can you hear me still? Yeah, that's, you that's, were right. that's the crashing. Uh, so we might expect this a couple of times. Uh, but the, the, to answer whether how, how fixed is the Global Village construction set, you learn some things, you might modify things. But the biggest idea there was actually to just get started. We know that we need to put shelter <laughs> around us to have food to eat, have basic technologies to make for prosperity. So start by saying, okay, simply what are the most critical things and the best best way to accomplish those things so naturally things like a tractor or a computer controlled milling machine a wind turbine or solar energy other things like that they're in the set some of the things that i looked for especially things that were like either expensive or not easy to get or just maybe not well designed just things that are gaps in our society yeah but I didn't, for example, put in a bicycle because, you know, this bicycles are quite abundant and there's not really a, a great power struggle over bicycles going on today. Well, that's great. Now, I'm going to ask you a little bit about the open source model for how these uh, products are, are constructed and yeah. evolved, essentially. Yeah. So, so it's the same idea as uh, a wiki or any kind of an open source thing with software where a, a group of people, each person contributes something that, and you build upon each other's work. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, that's accurate. The uh, open source refers to a development methodology. It's essentially that whatever you're doing, you're simply leaving a paper trail of documentation, blueprints, documents that allow anybody to, to see where you are. Uh, and then, then it comes into the licensing of who actually owns that information and the licenses we typically use, they're Creative Commons licenses, but basically they're saying you can do whatever you like with this. You can examine it, you can copy it, you can modify it, you can sell it. That is a big one. And actually the, the definition of open source involves economic freedom. The idea that you can build upon this to make a living, which is mm -hmm. a great motivator for a lot of people. Yeah. So these machines uh, people could build them in their local communities or I'm assuming they could actually purchase some of them uh, from yeah. your organization yeah yeah so th we publish everything online there's a page of replications on the wiki people have taken our blueprints like for example a long time ago 2011 or so uh, 2012 first guy took downloaded our blueprints completely independently built the brick press there's been several builds of the tractor and other machines but that's one way and then we also actually sell them we uh, the way we like for example right now we're selling 3d printers that you can go on on our website and click buy we also have another way we sell things which is through immersion experience workshops so that means we get a bunch of people to build the CB press the brick press one ton machine in a, in a single weekend so we've learned how to do these collaborative builds, swarm builds with a lot of people where we not only produce the machine, but it could also sell it. So there's revenue both from the actual tuition or a product sale. And that's, that's the beauty of these. We see the, a lot of potential for this, this kind of barn raising, Amish barn raising style kind of build model where you're helping one another. Like if you wanna um, knock off the, uh, kill off the housing problem, let's get 
swarm builds to build an build a whole micro house community in a city for the homeless or whatever uh, so we're designing our processes for two routes one is essentially for industrial like production and two because we're making it uh, accessible focusing on access accessibility we're designing in such a way that you can build things with very simple tools and techniques so for example on our printer you can take that into a mega factory and start cranking those out or you can put them into a small garage workshop and have the same efficiency in fact probably better efficiency in a small scale than you would in a larger scale. so we're designing it always designed for fabrication for us means that people have easy access to building these things including swarm like crowd-based builds with the 3d printer how much of these machines is being uh, built using 3d printing uh, how many of these machines well so actually right now strategically we've the 3d printer is actually the first product that you actually click buy on our website for but the idea there is uh, plastic is a very common material it's like one-third the material economy you know, there's plastic, there's steel, there's ceramic, um, three like metals, plastics, ceramics, uh, kind of like biomass, maybe four categories of materials that everything is made of. But plastic is important. So the relevance of the plastic is that you can make parts for other machines. Like for example, we use the, the 3D printers to print parts for more 3D printers, or we can print parts such as the seat for the tractor or the control panel or the rubber tracks yes that is right we're saying okay let's take these printers from hobby entertainment to real production using recycled feedstock so that's one of the top priorities to develop the plastic recycling right now uh, so we can print our rubber tracks for the tractors and that's completely doable now if you buy off-the-shelf plastic that's a little expensive it costs 20 bucks or like 10 bucks a pound that's very expensive so once you can actually start making your own filament from waste stream you're talking about a few cents per pound in electricity costs that it takes to process that plus your labor but then you have affordable route to plastic for larger things like plastic uh, lumber larger things like rubber tracks which are rubber is another form of thermoplastic that you can print so so to summarize, you're asking how is this 3D printer important for other stuff, I believe. Uh, yeah, it, you can make a lot of different parts, including very complex geometries, glazing like polycarbonate, pr you can print in nylon, you can print gears, so there's a lot of things you can do. Or if you actually, uh, 3D printing is a very generic process, if you put a, uh, one technology is called wire arc additive manufacturing, it's basically taking a MIG welder or a welder head, put it on the printer, and now you're printing in full metal. Now that doesn't have that wow. super precision, but you can definitely now talk about, you see the megawatt, uh, I keep thinking about this, how do we use this, uh, the welder-based 3D printer to build the tower of your wind tower, basically just going around and around and up and up, 100% uh, metal, technolo metal technology. So, so that's definitely useful for bulk parts, like gears or tractor parts or structural frame members lots of potential the parts the parts of your machine how much of the components are you making yourselves right now not a lot like for example we buy right now we buy everything we buy steel we buy plastic and then the but the whole mission is is called recursion it's technological recursion the fact that you're starting to go go back into the the actual feedstocks so uh, especially with the COVID right now, that made us focus on that quite a bit more. But the Global Village construction set does include things like here's your bio bioplastic production or things like bio plastic recycling, which you can take the abundant feedstocks, or metal recycling with the induction furnace and hot metal rolling. We're actually making virgin steel from scrap plastic. We haven't gotten mm -hmm. there yet, but that's definitely part of the agenda so then with the CNC machines in a set you can you can do precision machining to make engine parts that's that's in a set um, but at this point we're not there yet we're we we've, we now buy parts off the shelf but in the completion so the 2028 is the cutoff for finishing all of this which means we've got some good work to do we're about 33 percent done uh, but that's all upcoming that we can make 
literally the advanced civilization from dirt and twigs under our feet. Because I've seen that you uh, have one of the, these machines be uh, an aluminum extractor that actually takes yeah. aluminum out of Clay. soil. The idea is then you could actually even pre uh, develop the metals yourself, the metal, raw metal from which these parts are going to be created. And are Absolutely. you envisioning also a, a kind of a closed loop system where you can take the old parts, you can take the machines apart, recycle, reuse, reconstruct all the parts from them the, and the different modules Absolutely. and parts? Absolutely. So, so we use a highly modular approach. Like for example, if you look at our tractor frames, they're all this box beam tubing with holes, and that can be completely reused for other things, like a frame for a torch table, a frame for a bulldozer, a frame for another machine, or anything else. So the recyclability, like on a modular Lego level, that's one. The other one is that you're taking that and melting it down, shredding it and melting it down. So that applies to plastic. All right, let's try it again. Uh, so the, no, the last thing you know, so is melting the things down, which yeah, is melting. great. Uh, yeah, so three levels yeah. of recycling. One is one is you reuse the parts by modular design like Legos. Two, you melt, you grind them and shred them and melt them down, such as plastic and metal, steel. That's included. And then the third level is uh, designed for product ecologies that the which is kind of included in the Lego approach, but designed for product ecologies that one part feeds into another, another, like one part is a feedstock for another. Uh, so it's a complete, I mean, you, you said it, the circular economy, local material supply chains, which means that uh, I'm on a 30 acre farm. That means that even from the raw materials right under my feet, I can create entire civilization and that's that's true you've got aluminosilicate for making which is clay for making aluminum or compressed earth blocks you have wood out of which derives as a chemist you know that all of the synthetic chemistry comes out of biomass and carbon you have things like sand if you take silicon dioxide and reduce it you've got silicon which is the digital age so that's all doable and it's a question of access so we're, we're basically saying let's push the limits what let's do this experiment is it actually possible to do all that and do that efficiently and the things that we've been finding out is that as I mentioned in the, in the TED talk industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale so what are the limits of that well it's it's awesome and so the, uh, the idea is, first of all, you have modularity, so you can take parts out of one machine, insert it into various other machines, and then you probably, I'm guessing, don't have the issue of planned obsolescence that you see with commercial products. Like if I go buy uh, a, a cordless drill out there, and uh, a year later I have to throw it away, I'm guessing that your, your machinery doesn't have those issues. Absolutely. So you, you took the words right out of my mouth here. I think the one of the greatest value propositions of open source is lifetime design. One, by the fact that you can know what's in there so you can take get replacement parts. But there are other aspects like designing it for disassembly, designing it for lifetime. So I think that lifetime design is a huge value. Uh, and specifically, um, it's interesting you say that because right now we're working out what would our lifetime guarantee look like on a printer because if you look at it okay the frame that's steel I can completely reuse recycle the steel members they're not even welded they've got 3d print corners connecting them and that's by design so we can completely recycle both the plastic and the steel uh, as far as the other components we are des because we're designing it for the minimum parts count and maximum part interchangeability, the simplest parts you can get anywhere common off the shelf parts. Yes, that's an effective lifetime design warranty, um, which means, I mean, I looked at this, like for, for printers, the warranties there are like one or two years. Yeah. Our, my experience with 3D printers, I've had some off the shelf printers that pretty much after a couple of years, okay, so it wears out, say the controller burned out. Well, it's like, a few hours just to take out 
the part that broke. You know, it, it just, by the way they're designed, because they're so complex, it's literally unfeasible to service them. And that's a lack of design thinking. It's right. the same issue that I've seen in a tractor that started it all. It's the thing that when I took that tractor to repair because it broke, it t takes eight hours just to crack the entire tractor open to get out, get at this part. And I paid 2000 bucks for the repair, and broke, it, broke again two weeks later. And I said, forget this. I cannot make a sustainable civilization. Like I noticed that pattern in society. It's like, this is crazy. It doesn't have to be designed like that. It is designed like that because uh, I would say in general, the centralized industry is very inefficient from, s from various perspectives. And the, the efficiency of lifetime design, that's just not an, uh, uh, an equation for companies typically. So yeah, yeah, uh, lifetime design is a huge uh, positive point you get out of open source. The other part of design that it seems like engineering and a lot of uh, cor corporations don't do it that you that you implied was they only design halfway through the process up until you're using it and the thing breaks down. Now that there's the other half of the lifetime of the machine, which is now what happens to those parts? Mm -hmm. Do they get how do they get broken down, reused? Uh, so have you thought about? when you when you sell something that you basically will offer people that they can return it back when it's not working to you yeah. so that yeah. you can reconstruct reuse absolutely repurpose. because we're using generic and always and designing things to retain their value like components that can be taken out in their entirety and basically you retain about 80 to 100 percent of that materials value yes so simply put how about a warranty where for the rest of your life, as long as you decide, ship it back, we'll send you a replacement. That's where we're going. I think we can do exactly that. Do you see that the production of these machines will happen at a local regional level? Is, is that the intention that there will be small yes. factories, yes. maybe, maybe garage yeah. uh, industry? Um, yes. Um, the generic answer to that is the open source micro factory, which is a community-based manufacturing facility. It's like a like a, the equivalent of the community-supported agriculture for manufacturing. So a facility right now we have a prototype facility here that's about four thousand square feet, but something on the order of under ten thousand square feet, where you've got advanced digital fabrication infrastructure, where you can produce just about anything, delivering the promise that's been laid out a long time ago by like Neil Gershenfeld from the Fab Labs talks about um, that promise or Fab Cities talk about communities that that produce all they consume. Yes, uh, specifically we're talking about uh, an ambitious plan after 2028 to, to replicate massively worldwide as in these facilities that have the micro factories an essential component. So 10,000 to 30,000 basically one in every city basically getting to the equivalent of a Walmart instead of a Walmart you've got a production facility where you can either buy things that are already made for you or you can participate in that build experience if you want to learn more about it that's that's the model we're thinking so that you can re receive the training to actually develop the skills to build it yourself oh man and that's where it gets just beautiful because on our website which we're gonna put up pretty soon uh, it's gonna be you can buy product or you can buy production. We'll train you. You are our friend. There is no such thing as competition. The more people are doing it, the more wealth is getting distributed and more development happens on a product. And that's, so that's gonna be beautiful. And it's, it's so exciting. And one of the things that we know about ourselves as, as a culture is that people have lost a lot of skills, the yes. basic skills that you and I, uh, can fix our own house, fix our own cars, or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and for the most part, people don't do that anymore. Yeah. No, that's absolutely right. And the grant, grant more grand trend I was just reading about this today is the financial <laughs> financialization. That's a term on Wikipedia. But basically, we're we're turning from being real producers to symbolic analysts and financial people uh, that's that's a formula for collapse uh, all the societies that have done that to date have collapsed um, 
from the Dutch Empire to the Roman Empire, so forth. Once you get um, away from a central production, that's that's trouble. But it's just a very natural thing. We are very much connected to. Uh, we have a yearning for being productive and fundamentally creative, and there's no more powerful and easy way to access that by than by physical production. So I think a lot of people are just very much hungry for it, and that skill is disappearing, like with the millennials. Um, New, younger generations who don't get a chance they're, they're just not taught to make things outside of uh, more of the digital technologies yeah are you seeing part of your vision is to create more literacy among the population in terms of mechanical literacy being able oh, yeah. to, to do these things hmm, uh, I mentioned that we believe that appropriate technology or Sustainable regenerative technology is a prerequisite for democracy. You cannot have democracy without it. Uh, we also believe that part of that. I'm back. So I believe that <laughs> I believe that a prerequisite for democracy is a sound technological base. I believe that a prerequisite for a sound technological base is a technologically literate public and that's actually exactly what we're starting right now we started the program of the open source microfactory steam camps but the goal is to create a collaboratively literate literate public that can design and build things on a massive scale that means not not something that now your dirty job workers and some other people do but something that's 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 acceptable to the more white collar people that's still exotic and interesting uh, as the production comes back into communities from the remote uh, remote centralized production facilities it can be it has to happen because that's the only way we're gonna start caring about the environment because we just right. relegate that to far away we don't care what happens there it's not visible part of that transition to circular economies is ecological integrity because we cannot soil the the nature that provides all this to us. So that's why economic localization, you've said on your website, is a path to safeguarding the environment. Oh, it's because if indeed. we're making this locally, we have we can't do it in a way that spills toxins into waterways or damages the environment in any number of, of ways, right? I mean, we're living with it. That's exactly right. And that's simply pr introducing a a direct feedback loop regarding the true cost and true effect of our technological usage that has to be visible so we're pr producing transparency like in our mission a world of collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance that is very exciting March and so I know you had you had written this because you wrote it to me in an email yeah you wrote OSE specifications are essentially natural law huh. and that statement intrigued me very much and I'd like to know what you meant by that. Natural law. I mean there are some natural laws such as I don't know like gravity or the fact that nature like if you look at where wealth comes from it's from nature right all the resources that we have the rocks sunlight plants soil water all the economy comes from that uh, so natural laws that's like natural law that's we have to start caring about the environment uh, we have to start designing technology the way okay so technology is the way we take that environment and turn it into what we're doing right now into this computer that we're sitting on uh, so that question of law comes natural law following natural law means following more natural principles of how you do things with technology Technology means economic power. Economic power leads to the legal system and so forth. So there's this whole loop of, okay, there's, there's nature, there's technology, there's economy and politics. Where I think, if you talk about the governance, you gotta start at, here's nature, here's how we take, take care of nature and how we follow its principles to create our technological system, which then creates our legal economic systems. So that means things like lifetime design, ecological design, uh, just like in nature, biomimicry or 
uh, the things that there's no such thing as waste. I mean, those are just basic principles. It all derives from natural law, how things work in nature. I don't know if that helps clarify or did I miss some things? It does. It does. So the idea of no such thing as waste, uh, that's a huge challenge. I mean, this technology we're, <laughs> we're on right now is going to end up in a landfill. And, and, and some of those materials that made up this technology uh, is really precious minerals yeah. that were yeah, yeah. extracted from the earth yeah. and that, that were extracted at a very high human cost, not to mention uh, ecological cost. Yeah. Uh, so, but do you see this vision of yours as being able to, down the road, resolve that, where there really yeah. is no waste? Oh, absolutely. It, that's just a mind shift. It's it's this, it's a mental construct. This concept of waste, we created it. We can get rid of it. Uh, you also mentioned it's my my thing. It's, this is not mine. I'm just borrowing from all the giants that came before about people who created technology, who created ideas like democracy or invented electricity or whatever. Uh, so this builds upon all prior knowledge. Uh, but the thing is, um, if you study chemistry, well, chemistry, uh, green chemistry says that any any chemically destructive process you can do, you can do it in an, in an ecologically sane way. And that's happening. Smart businesses, businesses that are eliminating waste are starting to do that. Um, it's a complete choice we have. I could point to some examples like, oh, plastic. Well, the plastic example, all the plastic that ends up in a, in a waste stream. No, you take the shredder, grind all your stuff, all the waste, which is going to be like 50% of your garbage. Okay, so take a look at your garbage. Biomass goes in your compost heap. Plastic goes into the plastic shredder, makes plastic filament that you can turn into plastic lumber or some other useful good, like the casing for the computer you're using or a cordless drill. The rest, metals. You melt them down, recycle them. What's left? Nothing. It's like there's biomass, there's plastic, there's metal. Then you've got pretty much all your garbage. So part of the deal for our campuses, the OSE campuses, like this is our prototype campus of 30 acres, which is in progress. We don't have a campus yet, but let's do that. We, we're building soil now. We're uh, making useful products. We're recycling the ma metals to more machines. Uh, so the idea is how do we make that easy? How do we make that practical? It's it's completely doable. Um, so yes, absolutely. The question, the the answer there is, it's a piece of cake. I mean, <laughs> it just requires for us to to comprehend that, hey, let's do it. Why don't we do this? So that means we shift away from whatever others are telling us that it's impossible or just the mental model you just said, which is, oh, it's not possible to have no waste. Ridiculous. Nature does it. We're part of nature. Let's do it. Period. <laughs> The, the biomimicry folks say that in standard industrial manufacturing, uh, the focus is on beat, heat, and treat. And they're trying to develop methods of manufacture that don't involve that because... Sorry, repeat uh, that? To do what? Yeah, that, that the biomimicry people say that standard industrial processes use involve beat, heat, and treat. Oh, okay. And that they're basically arguing that living systems don't do that, that they, uh, they make things from at ambient temperatures, from materials that are readily available, and yeah. producing uh, byproducts that basically go right back as food, or at the very least as something inert yeah. into the environment. And as somebody who's not a technologist, I, I find it overwhelming to think that that we can get fast enough to the point where we're manufacturing the way that living organisms manufacture things yeah. like seashells, etc. But what what strikes me in your in your work is that you're bringing together some pretty remarkable people who have some te technical skills. Do, do you think that any of these challenges, when you bring the right group of folks together and they tackle them, are are doable, are attainable in a relatively short period of time. <laughs> you set me up for the 
another topic here, which is called extreme enterprise. But uh, the the summary of it is what we've been experimenting with uh, throughout the decade of our work is how do you get rapid collaborative design processes happening? Well, why to answer you know to start answering the question is like we think that we're collaborating, but we're not. Like there's not a lot of collaboration that happens in practice. Uh, so the promise is like software has shown what happens when you do have large people, large numbers of people collaborate. Yes, I do think that if you bring in all the interests together, you can absolutely solve it. But you have to examine how it happens right now. You will have one company that claims to be the greenest So you were saying how it happens right now. How it happens right now. Uh, and why we think this is so intractable. It's because of the yes. way things happen. So, so take a look at, for example, pick whatever name, the greenest, most progressive uh, chemistry company, the greenest chemistry company in the world with the most state-of-art things, or the most advanced biological wastewater processing system. Well, guess what? All that stuff is proprietary and unshared. T take a look at the hundred or thousand companies that, that vie to be in that space. What if they all work together? So that is the first thing we need to get past. The idea that we have something special and uh, we're gonna basically make that thing scarce so that we can benefit from that. Uh, so the world can benefit and we can benefit economically. It's a very... Uh, crappy idea it's that's the dominant idea right now so let's replace it by saying how what if we all collaborate and actually solve bigger issues not, not let's not just solve for that problem let's come together with other people and solve for an even bigger problem and that's how you're gonna get things things done um, now admittedly that is extremely hard it requires a lot of um, personal evolution on one side as in you have to have a strong self-esteem to be vulnerable to work openly, you're going to have to face critique and openness. That's called vulnerability, like Brene Brown, right? Uh, that's a prerequisite. It gets into self-esteem. So unless you're very strong internally, you're going to be like scared in a corner working by yourself. So we have to evolve very much on, on our psychological level. Uh, there's also this level where I, I think what happens is, what I kind of observe is once you start talking about open source products, some people just shut down literally just get really afraid like how am I gonna make a living they they get into the flight or f uh, fight or flight response with their reptilian brain so that kind of that issue has to be addressed uh, and that's what we're working on we're not we're not working directly on those issues we're saying okay let's show some examples of where we can uh, we know those are prerequisites but let's show some examples where this is actually doable and a, a good example of this so uh, I do want to bring up the idea of the difficult continue on a difficulty it is very difficult to bring a product to market in software it's much easier in hardware you need millions to do the prototyping every single uh, bug and detail needs another prototype you need to refine that cost million dollars millions to develop any product we have to address that issue and the the fact is it just takes an immense extreme effort a lot of resource to bring something to market so how do you do that in open source the sad answer is actually nobody's solved that yet. There's some evidence that this happens in software, but if you look at all the projects, uh, you can still critique it as, well, it took, took a, quite a bit of time to do that. Uh, it took way longer, like for example, even for Linux to come about, it was probably like a decade before it beca became a really <clears throat> formidable force. It took a few years to get to like where it started getting supported by companies but there's a lot of effort there for hardware that's even more difficult and we've got 200 years of industrial proprietary history so it's it's, it's extremely difficult so um how do you do this um very hard there are hints of that in open hardware and i should point this out the 3d printer once the patent ran out everyone started producing open source 3d printers the open source rep wrap project came about and now 3d printing is the responsible for most of the companies that are out there right now most of that industry a 500 million dollar industry desktop my uh, additive manufacturing uh, is about 500 million uh, that's 
pretty much due to the patents running out and the open source rep rep project if we generalize here yet nobody really noticed that hey uh hey open source did all of that well nobody really noticed it took a long time maybe like a decade to get to this point um so no no single example of where you have like in a corporate research and development department where you take like six months to a year maybe develop some product like a cordless drill or maybe a year or two for a car uh, i don't know how much how long it takes but we have to basically do something of that magnitude in order to to show that okay open source can do that so our latest idea is what i call it's called extreme enterprise so we've recognized that yes we can build things fast but it's still it's it's a long time to develop things so we're trying to say okay let's take like 200 to a thousand people or two thousand people create a very careful collaboration architecture based on standard principles of of product design using agile techniques and open source and let's do that where we not only develop the design but also the marketization productization of it meaning the website marketing assets the value proposition like all those business things that can end up like here's a both a design and the production engineering the tooling everything else production your team um, develop that how about we do that over a weekend let's get 2,000 people together so actually we're saying let's try that experiment uh, it's probably going to cost us a hundred thousand dollars to do that um, but a lot of it will be around um, this we have not done this yet but a lot of this will be around let's find people who are open let's allocate roles and kind of kick ass uh, in a way that uh, has never been done before and i think this is doable and you might ask well why doesn't gm or somebody who's got the deep pockets just go nuts like this and and get everybody around the table to do that and i think without the higher mission or the greater benefit for all I don't think you can really do that I don't think you can pay for that process there's there's an element of it that's that's about people going in there with their goodwill in some way um, but it's it can be it has to be based around developing real things um, I still don't have a clear answer for you like why why say GM cannot do this but I think a lot of the reason revolves around the idea of collaborative literacy they can even fathom the idea that what we're developing something that's open to everybody that now anybody can take and make a business out of that because for us when we do that extreme enterprise event we're gonna say okay uh, up front and um, organization of that we're gonna say okay who are the 50 or 100 or a thousand people who want to actually get into business producing that and we'll make note of that and work towards doing that so we're saying we're gonna radically distribute that say say the production of uh, uh, industry uh, standard cordless drills okay say we develop that so instead of a five companies making 80 percent of the worldwide drills of a 10 billion dollar market we say okay now we spewed forth all these open source people doing distributed production can we do that i don't think it happens right now because it's beyond the the consciousness of a standard organization to do that it has to come from a startup like us um, that's my think thinking on it and part of that startup, what you said before, was that people are coming t to work with you because they're inspired by your vision. Yes. And it's not about just you know doing a job and earning a living. It's about you know touching people's hearts and and their minds and and making them realize, wow, there's power in this. But yeah. one of the things yeah. that I I don't get about this this way of design. Yeah. is let's say you and I are designing let's say we're working on the same module for the yep. same machinery and you design something and I come in and I say wait a second I I think I can uh, do this better and I come up with a, a, a variant yep. and now in now there has to be some decision made about whose version is more workable or I I've always wondered with wikis and things like that, do we do people just end up undoing each other's work when they layer some element on top of another? Uh, how does it how does it get to the okay. best and highest use or design? So it goes back to the governance question, natural law. So there's so first of all we follow OSC specifications which is which is a list of like 50 to 100 principles. And people coming into that environment have to be aware of that and the more familiar they are with that that 
will provide criteria-based judgment on your design choices. But the cool thing is, Criteria-based okay. judgment. I want to hear about this. That yeah. will provide so, criteria-based judgment. Yeah. So you don't have to argue about it. You go back to your principle. Okay, so somebody, uh, principle number one could be modularity. Okay, so say you got two people butting heads, and uh, one, one guy says, oh, this is actually better because it's more modular. The other guy says... Mine is better. You, you can take that particular principle and evaluate it against that by certain checks and a quantitative score. And you can actually go through that through more of the principles. So uh, you eventually, in effect, would theoretically come up with something that works. And this is where like, it gets into like artificial intelligence, as you can even get that through artificial intelligence. But first, you have to start with the principles. But okay, so that's principle-based governance. Okay, but let's back up to how we run the agile process. Sure, get those, uh, get 10 versions of the same thing. Start with that. And then we could put in a governance structure such as, okay, now, that, now we then sit, sit around the table and assuming that we are honest, integral individuals, we will discuss it, say, which is better? These are our criteria in front of us right here. Which is going to be the winner? And we, we come together. And that's, that may be the hard part. But there could be heavyweight project management. That's one approach. We can, in, in our contest, we say, okay, well, we're going to have these scrum masters or, pro say, product owners or, say, the people that, we're going to say, okay, the people that are actually in this game to start the manufacturing business out of this, they're going to say, well, why don't we decide? Because we're going to be producing these. So you guys are designing here, arguing. Um, so, so you have to create a process, and that's, that's indeed the challenge. That's what we're saying. But we can say, okay, there's certain development steps. There's certain roles in that development process. And we can agree to certain principles of how we operate, starting with fundamental design principles based on natural law. And then go out of that. But you're saying, okay, how does the wiki, for example, get edited so you don't have conflicts? Well, typically you have maintainers. Um, the idea there is that people with reputation tend to weed out and upgrade uh, collectively the best, the best content. Uh, it's somewhat of a myth on Wikipedia in that uh, the way I understand it is that most of the editors are actually uh, paid. I think the way the way it works is you have a uh, paid staff that are the maintainers. Uh, I know there's a lot of volunteer contributions, but I think that there's a lot that's also paid for. So it's not it's it is a good example, but it's it's not like this free fall for all like people think. There's thirty million dollars paid to staff every year to make sure the thing moves forward. So you have to have uh, elements of organizational structure in that process but the general principle is like say you've got those 10 people uh, we can if we want to say eh, well how about it if all of us say that this is actually better and we're we're reputable in some way we can say okay the guy that's got this crazy idea nah, sorry guy um, we can maybe do like some kind of a majority based thing but of course we never want to deny the minority I mean that's that's a crime that happens today a lot um, but the idea is through collective wisdom, you can, uh, like, there's going to be, like, all this peppering of activity. Uh, in general, you have to say that the things that actually work are going to have to rise to the top. Otherwise, uh, you have anarchy or, or chaos happening. So it's, that's, that's, a, that's a big question, but I, I think that the general idea that's accepted in the crowd development process is that there's generally more good people than evil people <laughs> or people that um, like contributions that are worthwhile they tend to rise to the top that's how right. for example stack exchange works and it does a great job at that so there are examples of how you can do that and get the absolute best content to the top that's upvoting to things like upvoting so you have to put in all those kinds of mechanisms in there which are addressed by the digital economy there are tools to do that <laughs> 
you've brought some of these machines to prototype or, or and beyond that I, yeah. I'm assuming where they're actually functional marketable yeah and in that process of doing that did you have to be the benevolent dictator at times and say this this is the piece that rises to the top or this is the module or yeah or design fee I mean you can say I was both the product manager and product owner because I'm I'm the guy building them like if it's the brick press it was me who did the first prototype therefore I kind of have more authority than others like say a guy who just came in for version 3 and I've been at it for a longer time I kind of see have more primacy in it it's kind of it's kind of the meritocracy concept um, yes but yes the idea is that uh, I never yeah and sometimes you have to just basically say no this is the way it is uh, because mm -hmm naturally so because I'm gonna build it if you're not gonna build it you have no authority to tell me how I should build it right so a lot right. of it comes out in a wash right um, yes and a lot of times it's it's like you know there's established people on a project they have a general good working pattern and they get along and then they kind of carry it forward but um, b benevolent dictatorship is a good idea if it's merit-based yeah so I, I do like that have you seen different variations of the same machine built by different people? Exactly. That, so the second part of benevolent dictatorship is that anyone is welcome to derive their own. The plans are completely open source. You don't like it, fork it, meaning just copy it and build your own. No problem. So, so a lot of these issues are actually resolved because the code is open. So it's not like... I'm I have the code and I'm telling you well you gotta do it exactly like this no you're free to modify that's one of the four freedoms of open source so a lot of those arguments kinda go away and say somebody wants to make an enterprise completely in our view like make it like super hard to build or proprietary well they're welcome to do that too uh, they can go away in the corner and do that so we don't discriminate uh, against area of endeavor that's part of the freedoms of open source as we wind down this conversation, Martin, I want to yeah. talk a little bit about what kinds of initiatives can be implemented to bring this technology to our our local communities. Yeah. Uh, I, I learned about your work through discussions of community resilience. Yep. The idea is that beyond sustainability, now we're in a situation where the entire world feels a crisis at the same time as the pandemic has shown us and that in those situations global supply chains can be compromised all kinds of problems can arise and in in that happening the need to figure out how to make our community resilient so that if supply chains are compromised yeah. or the global economy is in collapse let's yeah. say there's still an opportunity for, for people to do something at the local level. Uh, ha have you given thought to how uh, communities like mine could could start with this, could come up with some strategies for implementing some of this on a local level? Uh, well, uh, so that starts with having products, right? So yes. you have to take something that already exists that's in a mature enough state that you can replicate. Uh, now how do we go about that because we we think about this issue all the time well how can people do this and the challenge is that it takes immense amounts of skill sets kind of skill sets that we don't have we don't get taught how to build things or how to collaborate with people uh, so it's very difficult like for example right now just to give you an example right now um, in the open building institute one of our collaborations or projects we did the cd home. We've got some other models of fully designed structures. One is completely free and has all the all the technical documentation required to replicate it exactly. We have that for the aquaponic greenhouse. And guess wow. how many replications are there? Zero. It takes an you immense mean skill has, set. Nobody has done that yet. Is that nobody you're has replicated if you have seen our aquaponic greenhouse? If you that's attached to you to the eco home yep. the house that you built yeah some of those glamour shots of the of the aquaponic greenhouse those are real well right now we we uh 
took down the greenhouse for the next Sorry about that. Um, the, the glamour shots of the aquaponic greenhouse or the seed eco home are not photoshopped. That is reality. Now, why, if the promise is such and the amount of uh, design integration is so intense, has nobody done it? Well, it's a question of entrepreneurial savvy. How do you do that in a, in a feasible business model that makes sense? Now, that means product development, and that's the phase we're on. We've got these amazing prototypes, and those are prototypes. Prior to be, being an actual business, you can still call that a prototype. It's a good working beta release, release candidate, ready for pilot projects, ready to be replicated in other locations, but it ain't easy. That's the thing. Mm. So what we're doing right now is starting, uh, that, that's the perennial question that's plagued us for the last decade. Why are we not finding tons of amazing people, entrepreneurs, who just run with it? That's what I thought would happen in 2008 when we first mm -hmm. did the, the production grade ready model of the brick press. How many people have started businesses on the brick press? Zero. Uh, including kidding. ourselves. Right? We, you can say we have somewhat of a business as in we build the machines and we build houses with it. Um, but it's the question of entrepreneurial savvy, productization, um, that thing that's the long last mile from the prototype to the product. So what we're doing about it right now is uh, we're actually starting OSI chapters. And we're saying let's start with a product that we know we can sell, the 3D printer. So right now we're actually taking people in for a one to two year program where we teach you absolutely everything of how you produce that and start an OSC chapter in another location. So if people are interested in doing that, that's a realistic opportunity right now. Contact me. If you can find somebody in your community that wants to make state of art 3D printers that are modular and scalable, it's only the beginning, that are already a good product, come to us and we'll teach you and there's a revenue model behind that and we're making that absolutely clear um, so we train people you start with something that's a bootstrappable revenue model that can sustain the rest of the operation because it's still development until 2028 and of course it will be forever but 2028 is the very explicit milestone of getting all the technologies down to the product level so we can provide that kind of training uh, and how does this work? So the, with the way the 3D printers work, we, we worked it out, and we, we talk about extreme manufacturing, very efficient product, production tool chains. So right now, you can, the way it's designed, it would take you about a week of time to produce about 20 printers easily, not a problem. We can sh show you the production engineering day by day, task by task, so that you're, for example, spending one week per month doing some basic production duties, such as the 3D printers, and then 50% of the time you have for research and development, and the last 25% is discretionary, like Google Flex time, where you do whatever you think is best for the, the further mission of OSE. That's kind of how we're trying to structure it. Um, but we do recognize that it's a long learning curve for people to learn how to collaborate. That's a big one right there learn how to do the advanced designs learn how to collaborate with the wikis using FreeCAD and open source software so that's why we're creating a right now we've got our first applicant coming in uh, application we just posted this a week ago um, for the OSC immersion for four OSC chapters explicit that means one to two years two years at 50 percent time one year if it's a full-time engagement but you're going to be building a whole uh, print cluster including actually a CNC torch table and the filament making infrastructure with that so it's a it's a heavy investment of your time and effort but it takes that kind of a time so we think that a good person in one year yes you can definitely learn the ropes to the point that you're running a sustainable business after that now what about all these other businesses like okay brick press or building aquaponic greenhouse well yes absolutely 
but but you have to come up with a pretty savvy uh, entrepreneur who can take on a project like that and go through the learning curves. This is very entrepreneurial, high risk stuff. Uh, and typically, today's entrepreneurs go go into Silicon Valley and do their exotic projects. And a lot of them, unfortunately, do not believe that there's abundance to be had for all. So a lot of the cultural barrier around creating an open business. Uh, we see a lot of, I mean, there's plenty of entrepreneurs. How many of them are doing social, open source, social movement entrepreneurship? <laughs> um, not a lot. Uh, no. So that is what's needed. Uh, if you, you guys want to collaborate, if, if say there's somebody who's, actually got some skill in compressed earth block who's a fabricator and would be a good entrepreneur bring him on we're just saying that we're looking for five-legged dogs somebody who is open source collaborative maker teacher entrepreneur too many legs on that dog um, so it's an educational challenge is what it is it's yeah. about bringing people up to speed on all of those things or have their teams be up to speed so yeah. you have a team of collaborators where somebody focuses on the market the economic issues somebody focuses on production or et cetera. But, uh building on what you just said so what about if you you pitch this to the local chamber of commerce or business community to say okay let's fund this team of five people or this team of one capable individual get them the training, get them the resources and support, including mentorship and business advice and a facility. Uh, but that's the kind of level it would take. So for example, if we were going to collaborate, the first thing I would ask you, can we get the spot? I mean, uh, who's going to have the money uh, as a young entrepreneur mm -hmm. doing ethical work? Not a lot of people. Um, so find the, the support structure for that. Let's apply for a grant or something or some and get that funded and, and make it happen. We can teach the teach people we would be one of the partners you'd, you'd need a person in the the actual actual agent the person the collaborator you need some men mentorship you need some funding uh, so there's a few moving parts to make it happen um, but definitely doable like if we can collaborate and think of a some concrete project like the like the brick press we have that is ready to go into production it needs somebody to develop a business out of that so that's an entrepreneur. It's you know it's a runway of a year or two to do that. So you know, and it's an exciting one because yeah. now you have a, an eco eco house that can be built from yeah. these materials. So so yeah. that it actually the production of the presses leads to the production of the bricks or the blocks that leads to the construction of homes. And now you're seeding. The local economy on uh, multiple levels simultaneously Absolutely. so something like the brick press we could just jump on that right now the question is how many of your how many designs uh do you have in in the can that could go to market today one you can take that one? design yes i mean we've done like 10 it's the same machine it's it's the Based on saying the the thing is done, you can take that. You can optimize a little bit on the production engineering. You can figure out a little bit more effective ways to do it, including if, when you get specific down to it, more s sustainable supply chains. Like a lot of times, we cannot get the same cylinder every single time, so it made it a little harder. Um, but so details like that. But beyond that, that machine is ready and can produce six blocks a minute. Uh, it's 5,000 block a day easily um, it costs a fraction of the industry standard costs it costs uh, 5,000 in materials the nearest competitor will to get a machine like that you would pay about fifty two thousand dollars last we checked so uh, it's there the, the question is now okay do we have a person and a support for developing that enterprise so what I would suggest very explicitly is okay send us a student or two We'll take them through a one-year to two-year immersion, and in that time, we are developing that business, and that's what it would take. And I can see microloans funding some of those entrepreneurs and say, hey, we're going to invest in you because we're investing in our community. Yep. And yep. I, I actually know people who are doing that kind of microloan work uh, in local communities here, yep. and they're probably all over the country. So that would be one way that we could seed this 
is by saying, okay, let's find a grant, let's find a grant or a loan for somebody who is very serious and can show that they have what it takes to bring this thing to market. Yep. Uh, and and we're we're very willing to support that effort. I, I mean, think it's a very important one to do exactly that to do the due diligence. I mean, we can. Yeah, that would be an amazing collaboration. So if you guys want to do that, we've got the technology, you've got the training, as in me directly teaching this person. And it's, 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 um, it's an interesting thing. After a decade of this work, I mean, we have got so much material. And you can, if you go through our wiki and just Google like OSC this, OSC that, there's just so much material including on a CD go home, an aquaponic greenhouse, just amazing business opportunities, but uh, it's not easy. And if right. we can collaborate on it, that would be an awesome point. So uh, going back to a question that I don't think I was clear about. So right now, the 3D printer could go into production, the press could go into production, the greenhouse could go into production. Yes. How many more? How many more machines or devices or or structures uh, do you think are ready to roll out as tractor? of today? So. Uh, the micro tractor we did. Uh, another prototype on that could be a pr pretty much replicating what we have right now. The power cube, which is the hydraulic power unit. There's a soil mixer. The torch table. After another iteration, that's like um, like a three month with a one full person. I can. I, I could get to get that too. We've built so many prototypes of that thing. Um, those are probably the greenhouse, the house too. Um, you can say in the CEB version, we've done like five or so of the prototypes of the micro houses. For the 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 house you see here, that's that's the CD go home I'm living in right now. Um, we have models that are so similar to this and simpler based on not the CEB, but basically panelized lumber construction. And that's actually, that's way easier if somebody wants to do something like that from, from the hardware store materials, which is not as sustainable, but it would be a much easier business to do. Uh, so those are about it, the, the five or so. Actually, another one is a CNC circuit mill, which we've done and published in a peer-reviewed journal. It's, it works great. Uh, the laser cutter also actually, um, is available for that level of deployment. So there's there's a few, like six, seven or so things that right now we go to the productization stage. Uh, we have a page on the wiki called stages of product release and we list like very granularly like 10 stages down to like full distributive enterprise where anyone can get training and it's a proven business model starting from the very first prototype. Um, we're at about Six is where you have a product that's ready to be replicated by others. And you can say we're let, like at eight or 10, which is basically the, for the three printer, it's pretty much at the distributive enterprise level where we can take somebody and teach them exactly how to do that and make a living on, the, on that. Um, that's tremendous. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the time that you've been doing this, certainly you've, uh, you've gained some wisdom about this whole process. And uh, I was wondering if you could share some parting words of wisdom with us parting, as we hmm. close this interview. <laughs> parting wor words of wisdom. I would say there's a huge vision difference between vision and execution. So over the last three or four years, it came to the fore how important the productization or the, the traction part is. Because you can do prototypes all, all you want and entertain yourself, but as long as there's, it's not easy for others to replicate what you're doing, then you're kind of entertaining yourself. So, um, you know, like in our, like switching to that entrepreneurial m mindset, now I tend to say that ideas are kind of cheap because we can all have ideas of, oh, we can do this, we can do that. But the real difference is the execution part, which is, okay, the rubber hitting the road. So really thinking about, okay, what does it mean for this to benefit many others? Um, and then uh, turn that into a point of abundance. So turn that enterprise into something that uh, 
you actually share like so so there's the enterprise yeah you can be successful at the enterprise well Microsoft was very successful have they changed the the nature of human relationships in some way yes but I mean have they changed the way the economy works no um, let's share and change the way the economy works that's it and the deepest form of sharing is sharing of your actual business model that means other people can get a livelihood from that and that is what is going to change the world in our viewpoint it's so exciting and I say that uh, from the bottom of my heart I think the work you're doing Martin is revolutionary transformative uh, and I would like to nothing more than to see to see your work be uh, out there in the world uh, yeah. so thank you thank you very much and you know just to wrap up with that it's like it's up to us it's like not me yeah I can have these ideas but without people like yourself and others actually stepping in and do it I, I can do my part but I want this to be available to every single community around the world so we're bypassing all our problems and literally it's about uh, actually yeah just ending up with uh, what we're trying to do is actually is create a funding model for good work so that means you can create this operation where you're funding you're doing a small bit of production that's open source highly efficient and optimized and then you can work on solving pressing world issues as that which you do for a living. That's our goal. Help us do that. We will. Thanks okay. again. We'll be posting uh, links to a lot of the OSC uh, pages on our website and uh, look, looking forward to, uh, to, to speaking with you more in the future. Thanks again. Thank you, Victor, so much. This is great. I'm stopping the recording. Yeah, no, this is this is awesome, and you know what? Like recently, I actually, I'm getting. Uh, you're actually the first podcast with the intention. Like right now, we have a specific campaign to get me on as many podcasts talking to other audiences, because a lot of times we've been kind of talking to ourselves a lot, i.e., like all the people that are already followers. So we're actually doing a dedicated campaign to to do outreach, but. You know, the cool thing, which I think what you're seeing here is if we get in touch with pe podcasters and people like yourself, there's a lot of people doing great work already. And we just need to connect to them and let them know that this actually exists and start doing it. Yeah. Like I said, I, I, I spoke with Richard Heinberg uh, at the end of the interview I did with him, and he was committed to doing something to develop practical strategies that any community can do to implement uh, right now to create uh, localization and uh, you know cooperative a cooperative local sustainable economy and so and I think that what you're doing is a model that's a really critical piece of it just how to bring these people like you and him and various others together and getting and getting us all uh, on the same page because I think we're all on the same page. I mean, yeah. you know, anybody who, anybody who's thinking about these issues, you know. So I've also interviewed somebody who recently who's doing alternative currencies, yeah. and I think that that that's a piece that's going to be very important because the you know the monetary system is just makes no sense, <laughs> yeah. and and we we could see that there's going to be a point where money is going to be scarce. It's already scarce, and yet. There, you know, we should be able to to still do exchange with each other. Yeah. So, absolutely. so I, you know, and so luckily here in Tucson we have somebody who's an expert on that. If if that part piece was to be integrated into a model and that's down the road, I, I would see it, the incentive for that would be if the currency system collapses, which you know there's no reason to think it won't. Uh, then and there'll be incentives to do that. But right now, there's plenty of incentives to put in the pieces that you've that you've created because yeah. uh, because there's a lot of people out here who are unemployed, underemployed, businesses closing down. You can't you can't tell me that somebody uh, in Tucson can't make a, a good living building brick presses or making bricks and selling bricks. Yeah. Well, so how would we move on that? Like, do do you have any specific? action points we can take on that I mean what I would explicitly suggest is like yeah get us a, somebody we can train uh, for a year or two of tuition uh, there's materials a brick press costs 5,000 pounds 5,000 uh, pounds it's 2,000 pounds and $5,000 in materials uh, 4,000 to 5,000 
Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there it would be find a person, find some support for them. Um, I mean, do you have specific people or organizations in mind that could be the candidates and the yeah. supporters? Well, one of the first thoughts that I have is my my wife is a mover and a shaker. Oh yeah, and Maria has been an entrepreneur very oh. successfully. Uh, she does yoga therapy, and she developed a school of yoga therapy called Functional Yoga. Functional yoga. What is that? Functional yoga therapy. Uh, it's a type of therapy that looks at structural issues in the body and how they affect your ability to move in the world and corrects and, and corrects them. So right now she's doing things like postural uh, analyses, postural assessments online because uh, she's not meeting face to face with people. So you know, there's this one, there's these wonderful apps that allow her to take a photograph of somebody and analyze. The where, where uh, hip heights are off, shoulder heights, you've got scoliosis, or you've got any number of things. Oh, nice. And she, uh, is this published? So, any? Is there a book on this somewhere? Well, she's working on a textbook. She's been training people for years, and they've been pressuring her to generate a textbook, and she just hasn't had the time until this pandemic to sit down and crank it out, and now she's well on her way to having a textbook. Uh, I interviewed her mentor, who's a guy named Joseph LePage, uh, who developed integrative yoga therapy and he is very influential he's out in Brazil so I could see him being involved in terms of trying to build commerce in Brazil uh, we have a friend who lives in a small town called Silver City New Mexico she is involved in a microloan movement and so they're trying to create microloans because a lot of businesses in Silver City have shut down during the pandemic restaurants and cafes clubs, bars, what few there were closed down and so she's looking a way to stimulate the local economy and she's she's a person who's worked for the uh, federal government, has a PhD, she has a lot of ideas so I would probably bring her into a discussion because if we can develop grants or microloans for people and like I said I, I uh, was I'm hoping to draft some kind of a plan, maybe in, in conjunction with people like Richard, and, and take it to my, my mayor and say, listen, we can develop a resilience plan to stimulate a number of different local enterprises so that whatever happens, if in a year the pandemic flares up and we have another shutdown for two or three months, you have businesses that can run themselves and survive. Yeah. So, yeah. so we want to, you know, so, so those are some of the pieces that I can see. Uh, uh, so the first place I start is I'm going to brainstorm with my wife because Maria is is a you know really brilliant uh, person in terms of having connections and having ideas about how to to do this. Now that I have a better understanding after immersing myself in some of what you're doing for for a few days, uh, I I think that the next thing would be to try to formulate to formulate some kind of a plan. So I think that we could bring I, I think we could bring you some students and and the only way I would invest in those students is if I know that they have a commitment to implementing to to learning the skills and actually implementing it and bringing it to market. Uh, so so we probably would need to see proposals from people that show that they have the background and the passion and and the wherewithal to actually pull it off. Uh -huh. But 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 I'd like, but I'd like to, to consider doing that. Yeah, another link I want to get you is OSC Chapters proposal, um, which is uh, how we we're doing it right now for the people applying for uh, around the three D printing. But the three D printing, I mean, that's just the first excuse. That's the that's the thing we have right now. It leads to like, for example, in the brick press, there's parts that we three D print that otherwise you know you'd be paying for. So, so it's uh, the three D printer is universally uh, applicable. Uh, but take a look at that model for how we're running that, including our application and kind of like the basic program. Uh, that will give you more insight. So tell me if you have a 3D printer. So your so your business uh, has a 3D printer. What kinds of things easily could you make with a 3D printer that could be sold, you know, in your, in your local community? Besides parts for some of these other machines. O-rings. 
plumbing fittings, connectors. So, like you could do plumbing, so you can you can build things for plumbing in your local community. Absolutely, a huge business idea is like, and we haven't done this is, and it, and once again, it's like yes, you can do it. Now that's called a business. So it doesn't mean that you just go out there and press press print and you have a part. No, you have to work out all the details, like exactly how you're stacking them on a the platform for most efficient printing, what kind of settings you're doing maybe a um, material composition like everything you need to refine to the point of okay this is the optimized thing that's you're really going for margin optimization because you're competing with like a 20 cent part but i think we can even compete with stuff like you know a dollar for a part or you know 50 cents from the pl the M menards hardware store that's all doable, but somebody needs to spend the time to refine that and perfect it uh, to make it happen. So right now, we've been selling more 3D printers because that's easy for us right now. We know how to do it. People buy them. Okay, but let's start. Like, for example, just now I, I did uh, a bunch of uh, gear down belts for the plastic shredder. So transmission belts. But each and everything. So you think about anything that's a plastic object, plastic or uh, rubber like object. Uh, trillion dollar markets. Uh, organizing yeah. cabinets. A simple fan that's but then it, you add electrical components like an air purifier, a fan, a cordless drill. All products to be developed. None of these exist. So here's the very important part zero of this exists in the marketplace and what do I mean by that you might have well what, what do you mean uh, there's a whole repositories of millions of designs on Thingiverse what do you mean there's no product there well um, they might not be the best design they might not be printable they might be actually not open the, the guys are actually saying that's private commercial non-commercial um, so there's a big difference between something that you see a file on Thingiverse and something that goes through the, the 40 steps of here's an enterprise development process. The, mm -hmm. the part or its file is just one thing. A business is a completely mm -hmm. different thing. And that's yes. the part that can be uh, swarmed on and that's why I'm starting this, the OSC chapters. Uh, each chapter will collaborate on or develop another product addition to what I mentioned before, the open source everything store. By product, by production. Yes. But that's a long <laughs> pathway. It's basically the next Amazon. And that's it's just coming and Amazon doesn't know it. They know it a little bit because they do talk about distributed on-demand production in their warehouses. Actually, if you read the autobiography, um, the, the everything store, it's not an autobiography, it's a book about Amazon. Um, so that's that's the, that is the next industrial revolution. It takes the leaders to transition from saying, "Oh, I'm forget that. I'm just going to go to Menards and get the part for fifty cents." Uh, people are not interested in these common mundane things. We are extremely interested in it. We call that distributed market substitution. Take any yeah. common object, a pen. Start producing pens start producing buttons or whatever mm. this is a 3d printed wallet that I oh have my money in <laughs> these are my 3d printed headphones that I can listen to you right now so the wow. answer is any I, I lost you though sorry that you got me you got me yeah. back yeah, I yeah, mean, anything, okay. print your comb, whatever, this light, this LED light, um, put some LEDs it's in it. It's all plastic. A lot of plastic. The, uh, one, one place I can see a, a, an instant application, so there's a guy in town who has a business called Bonnets and Stems, which they make, you know, plumbing parts like, like stems for valves. And uh, 
uh, a, uh, they don't make them, they sell them. They're one of the biggest supply houses in the country. And one of the, his mom started a business. And one of the problems is that it's very hard. <laughs> it, it's hard to get stems for old fashioned uh, plumbing now because, you know, if you have like a 50 year old moan faucet or whatever, and the stem goes out, it's hard to get the replacement part. So Perfect. he was talking about 3D printing. And, and that's something that where when you finally do print it, it's got some value because you go buy some of these parts from a supply house, they're 50 bucks, you know, for, for a stem. So now you have something that if you could manufacture yourself, if you have the specifications, and, and I know that he was talking about getting 3D printing set up there. So that would be, that would be an interesting thing to expand on what he's doing. So, so yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, I want to be part of this discussion. I also wanted to say to you, as a psychologist, um, you, the focus on self-determination theory is interesting, but the motivational theories are, are much, much more vast and multi, multi-dimensional. And so, I'd like to throw out some motivational ideas. To, that could be that's part of the psychological underpinning of this. Please do. At least, you know, yeah. Oh, please so, do. I'm open to learning. Um, in fact, like, so if we do this, maybe the way you can help us, if we do the extreme enterprise event, um, yeah. can I get you for 24 hours on one weekend? Absolutely. And, and what we, so, absolutely. In any way, that, how would you see me uh, being able to contribute? <laughs> Well, you said it. Uh, incentive structure and motivation is one of the critical elements we need to de design into the extreme enterprise pathway. Right yeah. now, I'm getting coaching from a pretty good business mentor, a marketing guy. He's very good at incentive. Right, right now I'm getting coaching from a guy who's pretty good in applied psychology, which is called marketing. Uh, but I yeah. do recognize the the huge importance and how we really need to understand it. So yeah, if you can, if you can help us on, because part of it is a for a, a very carefully architected event. Like how do you get, motivate people to show up and stay there and see the vision? So if I, if we can learn that from you, or you can actually help us craft the blueprint for the organizational side, the psychological side of that. I mean that is right on. That is the one of the critical pieces of what's going to make it work. Because this is not about like designing nuts and bolts. This is about designing human technology. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. Uh, a movie called Tucker, A Man in His Dreams. Uh, a man, I think that's called with Jeff Bridges. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie. Yeah, uh, Coppola maybe. produced, directed it. But in that movie, there's uh, there one of. Uh, Tuck, you know Tucker, the, the, the car, the Tucker yeah, yeah, car? Yeah, I, I think I heard of this movie. I, know, I heard of the Tucker, yeah. Well, so, so one of Tucker's associates, when Tucker was about to be closed down by the federal government because the, the big three car companies came down on his ass, of course, uh, his associate said, you know, when I was a little boy, uh, my mom used to tell me, don't get too close to people because you'll catch their dreams. But I misheard what she said was germs, but I didn't know the word germs yet. But she said, now I realize that she was right. She said, I've come too close to you and I've caught your dreams. And I think that one of the things I, I see from the time you did your, your four minute, that four minute TED talk, I've never seen a better use of four minutes, uh, Marcin, than what you did there. But what, what you did was you gave people an opportunity to catch your dreams. And the, the thing that, uh, that that is going to make this thing fly is to tap into something that I've spent 30 years studying, which is inspiration. What inspires people? Love it's not it. just motivation, but inspiration. And so and so I that's something that I I, I would love to be involved with. I love and, it. No, and, this is just yeah. plain absolutely out of control inspiring. No, that's a very important role that um, I know my mentor just told me you need to bring the people along for the journey because once you're going to start talking about this extreme enterprise thing I, I like it that you didn't get scared about it because uh, I'm, I'm noticing that I get two camps people that love it or hate it 
<laughs> but it because it really pushes them like what are you talking about? this is like crazy um and i've had both responses yes i do recognize that i need to be able to share that walk people through that dream yeah and and you have a great tool in that ted talk i mean i know that very often you direct people to it and which is very wise of you yeah because uh, that, that ted talk probably just opened all kinds of doors in terms of connecting people absolutely and i saw another video where you were giving a lecture and the person who introduced you said that you know he was turned on to you by that by that ted talk absolutely. so i would just you know i'm i'm going to help put put that TED talk out to the greatest degree possible on social media. And uh, immediately, I, speaking, I, I want, immediately speaking, yeah. what, who's beyond uh, self-determination theory? What, what else is out there that you're referring to? Well, you, well, you see, you go to, you go to what Maslow did with his, our hierarchy of needs is he took all the motivational theories that had existed until that time and he integrated them into one pyramid. And at the top of that pyramid, he put uh, self-realization. But then later on, is self uh, self actualization. But then after, at the end of his life, which is very interesting because it relates to your collaborative literacy idea, he he said, "Wait, there's another thing on top of self actualization, which is self transcendence, that we uh, that we aspire to connect with something bigger than ourselves." Oh. Uh, when, yeah, and and the the thing is that my work now is all about. I, at my most, at my highest place in life, I know that I embody nature, that nature, that uh, what, what the, you know, when you talk about natural law or natural principles, that those things, um, that those things abide in me. And, uh, and I, I feel that a human aligned as fully as possible with nature that when you do that, you find a path of fulfillment. You find some of the greatest uh, uh, connection with joy and 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 bliss that you can, and you connect with other people on a deeper level. And what you're talking about, in my view, is creating uh, a society of natural humans. I'm calling it on some of my podcast episodes, Homo Naturalis. Uh, that is our basic. That is our essence and connecting back to that and i you know i hear so many people say i you know well the problem is that we're out of balance we're we're not connected with nature well why the fuck aren't we connected with nature how did that happen and how do we we need to correct that in a heartbeat because i don't see any changes being implemented like what you're doing unless people understand we need to live in our bodies in nature fully immersed in nature in our bodies, in our societies, in our homes, uh, right now, uh, this shift has to happen now. Yeah. So, so that's why I'm involved in this at this point in my life, because because I I would love to be on the forefront of pushing that shift into a, a, a way of life that's more in balance with nature. Every day when we throw stuff away into the garbage, it hurts my heart. I you know every day I get into a car that I I have a Prius, but I don't care. It's still guzzling gas, and you know, breaks my heart. I feel like what what a stupid lack of vision this is. You know, it's just a lack of vision that we couldn't design a vehicle. You know, that that doesn't destroy the opportunities for future generations. I, I, at this point in my life, I don't have kids of my own biologically, but everybody's my child, and, yeah. and I I care yeah. about making sure that there's an Earth. That you know, Patrick's uh, podcast is called "Last Born in the Wilderness" for a variety of reasons. But one of the things is he's speculating. You know, are we among the last generations that are going to that are going to be able to experience wilderness on this planet? It's like, well, that's tragedy. So, yeah. and I like to, I would also like to transcend uh, along our current theme, the Homo Naturalis to Homo Naturalis Apertus. Apertus. Say that again. Aper open. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I would. I said homo homo apertus. That's what apertus, I would say. Yeah. There's an apertus open cinema project out there. Uh, but yeah, uh, homo apertus or homo whatever. But yeah, this, this openness has got to be part natural. It's all the same thing. Uh, I would yeah. say that openness, transparency. That's you know that's a natural law thing. Yeah. So absolutely, that you know I would say use me as a resource. Uh, I. 
one of the things I learned about this podcast is I am not an unbiased journalist. I choose people like you because I'm very biased. And I think that uh, I want to be talking to the people whose work I admire, who I think are doing the things that make a difference. And, and, and you're definitely one of those people. So to have you be one of the uh, people I get to interview very early on in this podcast is, is significant for me. So I'm great. I'm, Oh, oh, it is because this is only the beginning. As I said in my TED yeah. talk, this is only the beginning. Yeah. Um, but but tell me just to, just to knock knock out the uh, practical psychology question. So okay, so beyond Maslow, what is there? So like, are there beyond self determination? I find self determination theory com most compelling. It's like this is why we do things. Uh, but is there like what are what are the other camps out there right now? That are you referring to some other specific work or? Well, you know, if you look at all those layers, right, it's, it's important to know that those layers include, you know, basic biological drives. I mean, yeah, yeah. those are, you know, there's a lot of these things that uh, are universal for all of us, safety, esteem, uh, and, and what they basically did was they took, the, they took you know, the ideas. So when you, take a, when you take a personality course, which I've taught for many years at the university, personality, who we are, is considered to be a function of what drives us and what motivates us. Mm. But the thing about a lot of these models uh, is that if we are all driven by biology, if we're all driven by safety and esteem and accomplishment, then how, how, where do our personal individual differences lie? And, and a, lot, a lot of what um, what I focused on in my work is, is where there, there is some higher calling that each person has, and that's very individual. And, and a lot of people don't even know what that is. You know, so, so whatever you're calling, something that moves you, like Michael Jordan, there's no question that the moment where the game is on the line, the, the, the line between winning and losing is what he lives for. And that competitive edge where what you do matters between uh, you win the game or you lose the game. And there is a person who is more, more integrated with what moves him and his, his ideals and what inspires him than, than most people. That's why one of the reasons I think he was infinitely successful because one, he was more driven by that calling, if you will, that higher purpose than most people are many people don't even know what it is i heard an interview with him when he was 19 years old and he said he hadn't he was still in college and he said this is what moves me this is my reason for living and getting out of bed in the morning and so it's not just about knowing what mo it it's not just about being motivated but knowing what motivates you at the highest level what inspires you and and a lot of people don't have a clue you know, I have done, I've taught workshops for 20 some years with people and I've had 75, 80 year olds say to me, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Now, don't you think that's a tragic failing, failing of our educational system that somebody can get to be 80 years old and is never connected with the things that, that, they're, that, that move them passionately in this life. So, so what do you do? <laughs> What's your like? Do you have any tricks up your sleeve regarding how do you make, how how can you get people to, to recognize it? Yeah. Well, one of the things I've often done is do guide, a guided exercise where I ask people to go back to a time in their life when they were completely immersed and lost in the moment, when they were completely in, in, involved in what they were doing or experiencing. They were fully in their joy. And, and try to get at what it was about that experience that, mm. that made it so for them. Uh, and, and, and sometimes it's about helping them find a, a, a tag, a, a word or, or a phrase that describes that, what it is about that experience. You know, I know that I'm inspired by inspiration. That would be my tagline. I know that if you're inspired by it, it's going to inspire me, you know. I, I that's what I get off on. I get off on your energy. So you know, when if I meet when I meet people who are inspired, um, 
that inspires me tremendously. I also am, I've always been inspired in my connection with nature. I gave this talk, it was a TEDx talk locally, and what I basically said in moments of inspiration, we get out of our heads and connect with our bodies. And that is something that I can show people how to do. And I think it's very, very important because when you bring people together for something like a weekend and there's a bunch of talking heads and there's a lot of blah, 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 and people are going to be in their heads, it's nice to bring people into play experiences, into sensuous uh, connection with things like their food and tastes and smells and all of those things. It, and then I have developed a very simple technique called repose, which is a receptivity technique. You lie in this position that looks like uh, a starfish with your arms and legs extended mm -hmm. and you lie on your back and you do it for seven minutes. Uh, my lab did a bunch of research on this and we found that 30 days of people uh, lying in repose for seven minutes three times uh, had some radical effects on all kinds of things. Self-esteem, positivity, resilience, uh, on, and on and on and on and on. What does it do? I, I, my personal view is that uh, that what, what we're all tapping into, you have to be receptive. You know, you can't, you know, we, we, we're taught to just grind it out, to, to, um, to figure it out, to think harder and work harder to, to solve problems. But, but some of the great uh, folks like, you know, innovators like Einstein, Einstein took power naps and long walks every single day every single day. And so he understood that, that, that just being in your head, being uh, ruminating over ideas is not where um, great breakthroughs tend to happen. They often happen to people when they're walking in nature, taking a shower, or petting their dog or something like that. Uh, I wrote a book called The Way of Play that was all about using immersive, repetitive play as a way to empty your thoughts and clear your head. Uh, so there's plenty of research that has shown that play is a, is, a, is a tool for creativity, but they never understood that the play that works best for creativity is uh, non-competitive, not um, something that, that's, that's highly demanding of cognitive ability, so, you know, chess playing may not be an effective form of play when you're involved in a creative pursuit because your mental effort, energy is going into the, the ne your next move or your next set of moves in chess. Ah, interesting, so, interesting. But, but dancing or, or taking a walk or doing something physical, uh, playing with a yo-yo for me was my, my repetitive kind of play that I would do to clear my head when I was writing. I, I've, I've done a lot of my writing projects. I've had a yo-yo and, and a paddle board. What do they call it? Uh, it's this little board, little thing with paddle on a string and a ball. Yeah. And it's just repetitive kind of activities to, to clear your head. Yeah. So there's any number of, there's any number of things that are well researched that can be done with people to, uh, you know. Interesting, because once in a while I do some therapeutic chainsawing here. <laughs> I think destructive demolition kind of play. I mean, for a man, holy smokes, they have a place. They have places here in Tucson where you go into the smash room and you break glass. You just you put on this full body suit and you just break glass and you pay money for the privilege of doing that. Wow, wow, that's which I have awesome. to say is is very tempting. Huh. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, beautiful. Okay. So. Well, so we'll be in touch. I hope. Yeah. So, and what's uh, any any notes on schedule, or what's our next step, or anything like that, or play by ear, or my, my, I think my next step on my end is I'm going to sit down with Maria and talk about uh, how we can strategize, and so I hope to maybe send you an email in the next few days after the fourth and offer yeah. you some thoughts on, on something that, because uh, as, as the work with Nature and I has taken off, so has my interest in implementing some of these things locally. So, so let's figure out something that we can do. I'm also going to get in touch with this woman named Kate Bradley I told you about who's involved with microloans. 
and see if she has any thoughts on what we what our next move can be. So at this point, I have to kind of collaborate on my end and 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 then get back to you with some ideas. Nice. At the very least, we should be able to generate a group of people who would come and train with you. I want to, you know, I want to learn how to build a brick press. Shit. You know, I love dirt and so, so any dirt, I mean, cause there's different, I know as a chemist that there's different clay composition, different kinds of composition of soil. It has to have, it has to have the right amount, about 20%, 20-30% of clay and then everything else is like sand and aggregate. It, you do have to have the right soil, yeah. but I mean, we have tons of right soil here. I know your in your area you have the right soil, um, and you can't have too much uh, bio like you can't have too no, much. No, no, no biomass. Thing. That that doesn't do anything for binding. That that weakens the binding. It's the clay yeah. uh, ionic attraction between like clay molecules and the other molecules, or you can stabilize it so it's um, waterproof too. Yeah, but I mean like. You're just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have this stuff called caliche here, which is uh, this clay soil that turns into basically concrete, and you have to break it. You have to break through it with a breaker bar. Is the toughest stuff I've ever encountered. Well, that's, that sounds like that would work great for uh, CB, right? Or no? Yeah, that that sounds like that would work great for a CB, right? I think so. I mean, I think you'd have bricks that would be harder than than anything if you made it out of the the clay here, because the clay here is just some. You know, a lot of um, potter ceramicists work with the clay coming out of the southern Arizona because it's it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Very cool. Yeah. So. And if you approach any other people, like that's why we're doing a program, because I think one year experience for somebody, wow, that's either like a young student, but I think it could be tractable for some others if they do it as a 50% thing over two years. And I think that would be one year to two years like that should be good enough for somebody to get get trained. So like, for example, yourself, if you, if you do want to learn it, like, yeah, if you do it like 50%, say you got, a, I mean, you got a life, you've got other things that you right. probably you can't just drop your thing but for others that's why we're kind of thinking like 50 percent might be tractable for somebody who's kind of like transitioning out of something else and maybe wants to get into this yeah 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 well there's so many possibilities that are conjured so let me let me sit with it and uh i'll take a few days and i will yeah. be i will be in touch oh, yeah so glad to meet and yeah this is awesome so yeah let's go the discussion. Glad to meet you too. And so, and then once I have, um, once I have, once we have that podcast online, of course, that's a great res That should be a great resource yeah. for both of us yeah. to share. So. Absolutely. Um, now, I did record this for my personal ends. Do you mind? Do you mind me publishing this, or do you want me to keep this private? I well, I welcome it. That's fine. I I'm open source myself, so <laughs> okay. go for it. Awesome. Okay. Okay, Victor, beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, all right. Take care, Martin. You, you know, I, I, I love what you're doing. Keep it up, and it. Uh, I'm cheering you on. Thank you so much. Let's work together. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Yes, absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye.